Are we keeping silent when it's a time to speak up? And sometimes do we speak up and we should really be silent? Listen to Thessalonians. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And basically it's talking about Ecclesiastes 3. It says, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that anything be written to you. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord comes like what? A thief in the night. But do you know what? Almost nobody reads verse 4. Guess what verse 4 says? It says, but you brothers aren't in darkness that that day will overtake you like a thief. Wow. You mean we're not supposed to be blind and dumb? I mean, we're supposed to know. We're supposed to understand the times. It says right there, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, that we're not to be in darkness, that that day will overtake us as a thief. Why? Because we know the times and the seasons. But the problem is the English language. What does the word times and seasons mean? If you don't want the day of the Lord to come upon you as a thief in the night, then you need to get on the right calendar. This is the only way you will have an understanding of the times and seasons. Many people don't know that God ordained a calendar that was set apart from our pagan calendar as to when he would intersect with human history. The calendar of the nations that the nations use in this world is based completely on the sun only. It's a very accurate scientific calendar. There's nothing wrong with it, and we're in a world and we need to use that calendar. The Muslim calendar is based totally on the moon. But God predetermined that his people were to follow a calendar that was based on both the sun and the moon. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to divide the day from the night. And then it says this, let them be for number one. Why did he create the sun and the moon? Listen to this. It was for signs. The number one reason was for signs. And then it says for seasons, days, and years. And so the number one reason God made the sun and the moon was for signs. And when God said they were also to be for seasons, days, and years, he was not referring to this coming winter. He was not referring to December 5th of 2016. What was he talking about? Well, let me start here with this. Now let's go ahead and bring up the first PowerPoint. The word Moed. In Genesis 1.14, God said he created the sun and the moon for seasons. Now when you think of the word seasons, what do you think of? Winter, spring, summer, and fall. That's what most people think of. But the amazing thing is this. Did you know in Leviticus chapter 23, when it talks about the feast of the Lord, it's the same word. Now, when I think of feast, I think of a big turkey dinner. So when you see that Hebrew word moed, why did they translate it as seasons in Genesis and the same word as feast in Leviticus? What does it mean? Does that word moed mean fall or food you know what the English translation is inaccurate in both places if you look that word up the Hebrew word moed actually means a divine appointment so God has divine appointments based on his calendar when he wants to intersect human history so think of God having a day timer And the divine appointments were like Passover and unleavened bread, the Feast of Shavuot, which is known as Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. When it comes to our calendar and the times, like I said, the Muslim calendar is based totally on the moon. Our calendar is based totally on the sun. There's only the Torah calendar. That is what God says that he wants to use for his people. I don't know how many of you knew this, But we, I mean, we celebrate all the festivals. We celebrate Passover. We celebrate the resurrection. But do you know because the church is basically on the wrong calendar, the resurrection was celebrated a month before he died this year? (laughs) Easter was a month before Passover. Now, how does that happen? It's because 
we took Easter, we put it on the solar calendar. Let me ask you this. How many of you think we should celebrate Easter on the Muslim calendar? Well, why would we want to celebrate it on the world's calendar? It's the same concept. We need to keep these festivals on God's calendar so we won't miss the divine appointment. The devil wants to change the times and the seasons, the, the laws. Why? Because the greatest thing he can do to make you miss a divine appointment is to, uh, like if, let's say you're in a restaurant and you're in sales and you have a day timer and you're going to make a, a, a big sale and you're going to meet someone for an appointment and you end up leaving and you forget your day timer and then you go back, but unbeknownst to you, your competitor was there, and he goes in and he changed the time of your appointment so you miss it, and he goes an hour earlier. Wouldn't that make you upset? Well, this is what has happened. The world has decided to go off the biblical calendar onto a different calendar, and so, so many times we're missing these divine appointments that I want to talk about here. Did you know Moses made everything after the pattern that is in heaven? Remember Moses' tabernacle? God says, I want you to make it after the pattern. What that means is, whatever's happening on earth is an echo of what is happening in heaven. In Leviticus 23, God declared that these divine appointments were to be times for a holy assembly. But even more, they were to be, get a load of this, prophetic dress rehearsals for the coming of the Messiah. Does anybody here want to be at the wedding of the Messiah? <laughs> then why wouldn't we want to be at the dress rehearsal of the wedding? How many of you want to be at the coronation of the Messiah when he's crowned king of kings and lord of lords? Every year on the feast of trumpets, I mean trumpets is how you coordinate the king. This is the proclamation. Do you know every year on the feast of trumpets, the angels in heaven and everyone else who's up there is practicing the return of the Messiah? And so we on earth here are also on the very same day practicing the return of the Messiah here. So at the very moment they're worshiping and the praising of the king in heaven, we're down here worshiping and praising the king. And some moment in history we'll be caught up to join the heavenly choir at that very moment. <laughs> Yeshua died on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He rose on the Feast of First Fruits. Shavuot, or Pentecost, was fulfilled on Pentecost. Let me show you something here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. They have the Hallel, and it's, the Psalms was their hymn book. Many of you are familiar in Matthew 26, 30, where it says when they had sang a hymn, uh, literally it would be the Hallel, they went out to the Mount of the Olives, out uh, to the Mount of Olives, you know what? How many of you know the words to the song that they sang? Come on now, some of you know. I can tell you the very words to the song they sang at that Last Supper. Why? Because they sing it every year. It was Psalms 118. That was the last hymn they sang before Yeshua was betrayed and rejected. So they always sing Psalms 113, 118, and every Passover Seder, those of you, we had 1,500 people at our Passover Seder this last year. And it always ends singing Psalm 118. So Psalms 118, what were they singing right before he was betrayed and rejected? Get a load of this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, and this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Isn't that amazing? If you remember in Revelation, it says Yeshua basically was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means it was planned out from the beginning. It's not like Yeshua died and the father goes, oh no, we got to go to plan B. This was planned. Think about this. The father so loved the son that he planned his funeral to uh, 4,000 years in advance. Even in, when David was created 2,000 years earlier, what the father did, he had David write the funeral hymns that were going to be sung at his son's funeral. This is incredible when you think about it. Get a load of this. If you remember, in the Gospels and Mark, it says Yeshua was bound to the cross the third hour of the day. Do you realize the third hour of the day is nine in the morning? That's the time of the morning sacrifice. So at the very moment, they're binding Yeshua to the cross. What is he hearing Josephus says there were 2 million Jews in Jerusalem for Passover. 
Two million Jews, a two million member choir, and they're all singing. At the very moment, they're binding the Passover lamb to the horns of the altar. At that very moment, they're binding Yeshua to the cross. And at that very moment, they're singing the song that the father pre-planned. Listen to what they're singing. Psalm 118, the Lord is God. He's given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. So Yeshua is hearing them sing, bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. At the very moment, he's being bound to the cross. At the very moment, the Passover lamb is being bound to the altar. And then what do we find? What happens at the sixth hour of the day? That's noon. We all know on Nisan 14. That's when it happened. That's why if we don't know, the Bible says Passover had to be on Nisan 14. But it falls on a different day on our calendar every year. So we have to keep know when Nisan 14 falls if we're going to honor keeping the Passover. But what is Yeshua hearing at noon when the lights go out? Everyone is singing, the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord is doing valiantly. It's like, the, remember the Lord said, if the Son of Man be lifted up. And here they're singing, the right hand of the Lord is being lifted up. He's being exalted. And then what do we find at the ninth hour? The ninth hour is three in the afternoon. It's the time of the evening sacrifice. So what is Yeshua hearing on Nisan 14 at three in the afternoon at the time of the evening sacrifice? He's hearing everyone sing, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he's become my Yeshua, my salvation. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. So God had this timed out not only to the day, but to the very hour as everything was going to unfold prophetically. And then what do we find? He dies and he's buried on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we know Yeshua was unleavened. He was without sin and he's in the grave for three days and three nights. But the same night that all the firstborn of Egypt died, the firstborn of the father dies and he's buried. Many Christians aren't aware that the Jews have been keeping quote unquote Easter for 1,500 years. It's the Feast of First Fruits. Every year they celebrate the Feast of First Fruits. This is why Yeshua became the first fruits of the resurrection on the Feast of First Fruits. That's when he rose. And then that brings us to the Feast of Shavuot. Many of us know as Pentecost. But the amazing thing to me, again, most believers think Pentecost started in the book of Acts not knowing the Jews were required to keep the Feast of Pentecost 1,500 years earlier. In Deuteronomy 16, 16 and many other places, three times a year, it was known as one of the pilgrimage feasts, all the Jews had to come to Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So the Jews were the first Pentecostals. They were. And do you know to this day the Jews still keep the Feast of Pentecost? And I don't know any Pentecostals who do. I'm serious. I, 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 you know, I'm just saying that we, we've, because we've cut ourselves from our roots, we've lost in one sense what time it is. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you believe that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you? Do you really? Up here or down here? Now, I, I, this is going to be a theological, mind-blowing thing I'm going to tell you. So you better make sure you're correct. You really believe that? Well, get a load of this. The spring feasts all talk about Messiah's first coming. He died on Passover, buried on unleavened bread, rose on first fruits, all these to the very hour of the day. And then Pentecost didn't happen in December. Pentecost was fulfilled on Pentecost. Now, here's the thing. If the Lord is truly the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he fulfilled the spring feast to the day of his first coming, he'll fulfill the fall feast to the day of his second coming. Yeah. Wrap your head around that. But he's going to do it on his calendar, not on ours. And how many of you know the feasts have to be fulfilled in order? You're not going to have the Spirit poured out on Pentecost until he rises from the dead. He's not going to rise from the dead until he's buried. And they're not going to bury him until he dies. 
The fall feast, the next feast to prophetically be fulfilled will be the Feast of Trumpets. Do you hear anything about trumpets in the book of Revelation? Hello? The next feast that will be fulfilled after that will be the Feast of Yom Kippur, which is Israel's Day of Atonement when they'll realize Yeshua is their Messiah. And then the next feast is the Feast of Tabernacles where Yeshua comes back and he tabernacles among men for the thousand-year reign. And this is why he said, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Acts 3, 16 through 18 talks about Yeshua has to stay in heaven now until the restoration of all things. One of the things that needs to be restored is God's calendar. So just as the spring feast had to be fulfilled in order, so too the fall feasts. And you know what? These sacred assemblies are really God's parties. That he's held for us. It's an invitation. You hear the gospels. Invitations have been sent for people to come to the wedding. And they say, oh, I don't want anything to do with it. I got to go plant a field. I got to take care of my cows or whatever it is. But these really are dress rehearsals. In Leviticus, they were called convocations, which means assembly. But the Hebrew word is mikra. And it literally means a dress rehearsal. So this is why they literally rehearsed killing the Passover lamb every year on Passover because that's when he was going to die. They rehearsed the Feast of First Fruits every year because that's when he was going to rise. Well, every year on the Feast of Trumpets, this is why we want to be here because this is the dress rehearsal for the coronation of the Messiah. Wow, this is exciting. So the Feast of Trumpets, I believe, speaks of the resurrection of the dead as well as the coronation of the Messiah. And so uh, in my book, uh, God's Day Timer, I lay out all the feasts from the spring feast to the fall feast, what prophetically should happen on those days according to the Bible. And the Bible says that God declared the end from the beginning. And so if we want to understand the end of days, we need to look in Genesis, not just Revelation. In Psalms 102, listen to this, verse 16 and 18. It says, when the Lord will build up Zion, that's when he's going to appear in his glory. When the Lord will build up Zion. When did Jerusalem get Zion, or, or when did Israel get Zion back in their hands? 1967. And then what's been going on all this time politically? Everyone's upset because they're building up Jerusalem, all the settlements. That's what they're screaming about. Well, listen to this. This is what it then says in verse 18. After it says when the Lord will build up Zion, that's when he'll appear in his glory. It says this is written for the generation to come. You know, in the Hebrew, the word is akaron, and it means this. This is written for the terminal generation, the last generation. And so my question is this. Look at this. This is the growth of the settlements from 1974 all the way up to about 2009. Look how Zion has been being built up. That's right. This is from last November. Israel approves 454 new settlement homes in East Jerusalem. Look at this one. This one uh, is pretty recent as well. It says, Israel's settlement drive is now becoming irreversible. What are we going to do? This is what the diplomats are fearing. Uh, This one here, it says, the Israeli government is to allocate 17 million more dollars to help build up the biblical homeland. I tell you what, God is building up Zion. And you are living in that terminal generation where you're going to see the Messiah appear in his glory. Talking about what time it is, I'll tell you what time it is. It is time to introduce Jonathan Kahn. Jonathan Kahn is the president of Hope of the World Ministries. He's the senior pastor. He's the Messianic rabbi of the Jerusalem Center, Beit Israel, in Wayne, New Jersey. He's the author of the best-selling book, The Harbinger, and The Mystery of the Shemitah. 
His teachings are broadcast daily over hundreds of radio stations throughout the United States and the world and on television. So let's give a big warm welcome to Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Thank you so much. It is good to be here in Washington and Seattle and El Shaddai. This is like where I, I mentioned last time, we're on a, one side of the coast. We're holding it. We're trying to hold it down there, and you're holding it down here. And it is a blessing to be here because I know you love the Lord and you are hungry for all things of the Lord. And so I try to give you a lot. And so I have about 130 pages but I go quick. Uh, at the end, I don't want to ever leave without giving the ironic blessing. And, uh, I, you know, and uh, there's a special clip I want to show at the end to encourage you. I don't do this everywhere. I do it at some points because it's being like family. We'd love to see the, my boys, the latest, the latest, my two boys. Uh, if you have Diel. That's the little one, and uh, I was recently speaking in Florida, and my kids wanted to go to Disney World, and so we went on a ride that featured these movie characters. At the end, they had the animated witch from The Wizard of Oz threatening us, and my little pretty, and all this stuff, and Diel turns to us and says, this doesn't look good. <laughs> and, and she's going on and on, and Diel's upset, he's indignant, he says, that witch wasn't nice. And my wife says, well, we can pray for her that she finds Jesus. And Dale turns to her and says, Ma, it's not real. <laughs> and the other one is Eliel, if you have that, who's, our, uh, who's six years old. And he was recently saying his prayers at night, and he said something that alarmed me. He said, Lord, help me to sin. And I had some concern. I said, wow, I mean, did I fail him? And what? He said, no, he said, help me to sin against the devil. I said, that's a good concept. <laughs> Last time I was here, an amazing door had opened for me to speak at the United Nations, and it happened again. I don't know how or why, but it happened again. And so just a little while ago, it was called the Global Summit on Development. I wasn't sure what the theme was, so I decided to forget the theme and just say what I believe they need to hear. So I spoke about Israel and the Abrahamic Covenant and blessing Israel. And, and uh, the persecution of believers and about the end, I spoke about the end time prophecy and then I just got out of there. Um, you may, they may have a picture. I don't know if they have a picture. Yeah, that's, that's there. I'm going to share a lot, but no matter how much I share, uh, I of course cannot do so much that I would want to. And so um, what I will do, I did it last time. It was great because it's a chance for me to, I, I'm blessed to meet you. Afterwards, I'll go over to the tables. I'll meet you there. I'll sign as many as I can. I'm not a promoter. My job is to get the message out to as many people as possible. They have, so they will have five special resources that will be there tonight. And of course, number one, I think you know, is the Harbinger. And this came out. It's been, I'm going to share some things that have been continuing to happen. The template is continuing, even something in there which you never would imagine was there that has to do with what's happening right now. Millions of people have read it, but millions have not too. So if you know those who have not, also then is the second one is the Harbinger Companion, which goes the deepest into everything with charts, maps, pictures, uh, where the Harbingers are, uh, study guides, all that's the deepest uh, treatment of all of it. Then there is um, the... Mystery of the Shemitah, which I'm going to show you tonight, has actually what has happened, what is happening, um, and you'll actually see that. I'm going to, uh, I'll speak about that tonight, as well as many other things. Um, it is continuing to affect our lives. Also, then they have, there's two DVDs they have. One is the Harbinger Decoded, which is really a prophetic explosion, and you actually see the Harbingers happen, and it's the most powerful thing to show people, and there's a lot of bonus things, all sorts of other things on there. And the last one is the mystery of the Shemitah Unlocked, which also, I didn't do it, they, uh, World Night Day, they did a very powerful prophetic explosion, and it's got about an hour of other things on it on top of what it, on top of the presentation. So together, that, that represents the major works concerning where we are now, and 
Even if you read it or seen it, if you have people in your life who have not, I'm going to do something. What we're going to do is we always seek to reduce the price to make more available. So what they're going to do tonight is going to be even more than it has ever. It's normally $15 for one. It will be that. For uh, two, it's going to be 14 Three, it's going to be 12 Four, it's going to be 10 And all five, it will be $8 each. The point is to get it out. And I've never done that, and they've never done that. This is the, truly it's a, to get it out. I'm doing it tonight. I know you, you, know, you love the Lord. And, so if you want if you get all five, it'll be for that, and you can also mix it out, what if you want, all of one or whatever it is, and I will seek to sign everyone that I could, can do that tonight. So it's going to be as long as it lasts uh, out there, we'll, we'll make that available. Um, I'll meet you afterwards. Now, just last thing is to get in touch. For those who want to get in touch with the ministry or get more, the, the Harbinger is one out of 2,000 messages. Uh, the, the ministry is Hope of the World, and it's uh, Hope of the World on the web, just hopeoftheworld.com, and they send out free things, free gifts and all that, and they will, I believe, have a sheet there, and if you, if you put a contact on there, they will send you free CDs and prophetic updates and many other things. So that'll be all there afterwards. I just completed the, the next major book. Actually, tonight, I'm actually finishing it in the hotel room. But it will be released uh, soon. It's not yet released, so we don't have it. Um, but you'd like to see the image of it or the cover? That will be, the Book of Mysteries will be out in September. And if the Harbinger was one mystery, this is opening up hundreds of mysteries. Um, and it will, you can't get it yet, but if you, on Amazon, they have it and you can actually pre-order. So that's all there. So let's pray and let's get ready. Father, we praise you tonight. We thank you. Father, that we can gather in your presence tonight. Lord, you're awesome in all your ways. And Father, we ask that you would touch your people who are here, who are hungry for you, who, Lord, we ask that you would speak, and I ask in my weakness, be strong in your power and have your way. In the name above all names that are named, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world and the glory of Israel. And we say, amen. We are at a critical time. The ground is shifting literally beneath our feet. Changes taking place of biblical proportions, prophetic times. And we need to know the times in which we live and the signs of the times. And we need to be prepared and to live and respond accordingly. I've shared with you the, from the harbinger the mystery ground and that where the nation was dedicated to God, that's where the shaking, the judgment, the destruction came. America being dedicated to God on ground zero. And when it was that day, the first president in his inaugural speech, George Washington, gave this warning, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven has ordained. In other words, if America ever turns away from God, the blessings of heaven will be removed from the land. Remember that because it's going to be important tonight as we get to where we are. First thing, did the Shemitah manifest and where, we are, where are we now? Anyone who knows me and also, as you know, Mark, knows that I will always warn, give the warning as well, that God, you cannot put God in a box. If you do, he gets out. <laughs> always God is sovereign. He doesn't have to do anything at any time that, except as he chooses. And there are, there are, nothing had to happen in the Shemitah. But the answer, did anything happen? The answer is absolutely, unequivocally, yes. I'm going to show you some things tonight. What you're about to see is not feelings or opinion, but absolute, hard, massive facts bearing witness to how real God is and how much he is in charge of everything. The predominant pattern of the Shemitah, the, for those who don't know, the Sabbath year of God, the year of rest, economic rest, ultimately financial cleansing, is not necessarily of a one-day crash that happened in the last two, but of a long-term extended economic or financial collapse. Now this takes place in the financial or economic realm over a period of months or it could be more. It happened in the last half century, the last seven or I will say eight Shemitahs every single time it happened. The Shemitah of 2008, it manifested in the global financial collapse, the Great Recession. 2000, Shemitah of 2001, long-term stock market collapse, economic recession. 
Shemitah of 1994, the great bond market massacre, the greatest bond market collapse in history to that point, which is twice the size of the stock market. The Shemitah of 1970, 1987, it happened with a crash, a, a stock market crash, and the greatest day crash, percentage-wise, in history, Black Monday. Shemitah of 1980 was an economic recession leading to a stock market collapse. Shemitah of 1973, stock market collapse leading to a global recession. Shemitah of 1966, stock market collapse. What about the Shemitah of 2015? Again, nothing had to happen, but did it? The answer is absolute. Up until the Shemitah, the stock market was rising and rising and rising and rising. In the spring of the Shemitah, it reversed its momentum, began a long-term descent. The collapse took place all over the world. The Dow Jones Industrial S&P 500 began collapsing in May, along with markets around the world. As we approach the summer, the peak of the Shemitah, the Nasdaq collapsed, the Russell 2000 index collapsed. How severe? The Shemitah of 2015 wiped away 25% of the German market, 4,000 points of the Indian markets, 12,000 points of the Brazilian market, $2 trillion of the American markets, and the world markets, $11 trillion wiped out. And let me actually show you how the ancient mystery struck the financial realm. What you're about to see is the Dow Jones Industrial. If you can put up image six, if you have it. That's, that's the Shemitah and the Dow Jones Industrial. That's what happened there. Now, what you're gonna see in the bigger picture, if you look at the several years leading up to the Shemitah, and you'll see what the Shemitah, I believe, believe is going to be shown in pink. If you put up, e yeah, the next one. That's the Shemitah, what it did to the British market. Everything's rising until that happened. In the year of the Shemitah, now we tend to have an American-centric view of life and sometimes prophecy. But in the last Shemitah, a change took place. Another nation, it wasn't America that was the center anymore. Another nation had taken over in the years going up to it to become the largest exporter nation in the world. That was, you can guess, China. In the year before the Shemitah began, China supplanted America as the largest trading nation. In the Shemitah of 2015, China was the engine of the world economy. So did the Shemitah strike China? The answer is powerfully. What happened in the summer of the Shemitah, peak of the Shemitah, the, Sh the Chinese stock market begins to collapse. How much was wiped out? 43% almost half in two and a half months, which makes it the most dramatic, intense collapse in world history. Then the 2015 Shemitah came to, the, as it came to the close, the internet was flooded with articles, not from Christian sites, but secular sites, with these headlines. If you put up image 17, this was the worst year to that, since when? 2008. What's 2008? The last Shemitah. Image, image 18. Wall Street records its worst year since, same thing, Shemitah. Next one, Dow, uh, the S&P 500, same thing. Tum another one, Tumultus 2015. In other words, it was the worst year for the stock market since the other Shemitah, in which is how many, seven year cycle, same exact thing the Bible says. But it doesn't stop there. In the Harbinger and the Mystery of the Shemitah, it's written that the effects of the Shemitah is not just in the financial realm, but also affect production, trade. Just like in Israel, all these things would either decrease or cease. So did the Shemitah affect global trade? Image 20. Global trade collapsed in the Shemitah. Image 21. Collapsed again. World trade, image 22, saw the biggest contraction since 2008. Again, the seven-year cycle of God. And now they actually put up image 23, and that is a, well, more and more. This, what you're going to see right now in a moment, there, there's something called the Baltic Dry Index, classic global indicator of world trade. What happened? What did the Shemitah do to the Baltic Dry Index? Image 25. The Baltic Dry Index hits a 30-year low, but the thing is it's worse than that because the index has only existed for 30 years. So it was the worst year in history. Now, that, in history, literally. And so, and literally it started in 2014, the, the number was, was over 2,000 points. By the end of 2015, the number was 400, collapsed 80%. Commodities, during the Shemitah in Israel, the commodities would be left alone, the fruit of the land. So did anything happen? Well, during the Shemitah, the commodities index around the world collapsed as well, image 28. It was the worst year there, if you have it, they don't, but it's the worst year of 
dry bulk in, as far as I know, in history. Look at image 29, you'll see a graph of what the Shemitah did to commodities around the world. And one of the ways you already know it already affected you is when you go to the gas station. Because one of the commodities in the world is oil. So what happened? As oil, oil started collapsing. Now this is good for you. You can, give, you can be thankful for the Shemitah in this. And you see a dramatic thing. If you put up image 30, you see those two pink things. Those two pink areas are the last two Shemitahs, 2008 and 2015. Look what it does to the price of oil. That in each case. And the effects have continued into 2016, image 31. And one of the things it says in the book, it speaks of production being uh, affected as well. Did the Shemitah affect global production? Image 32. China, the factory of the world, begins to contract. It's the worst time since the, the end part of the last Shemitah. And then and goes on, image 37. Industrial production in America collapses. Even the retail section, image 39, collapses. Image 40, retail apocalypse, major chains closing. It affected anything, everything. In the book, there's a Hebrew word called tabua. Tabua in Leviticus 25 speaks of in the year of Jubilee, in the year of the Shemitah and Jubilee, you're not going to be producing. So tabua, you're not going to have tabua. Well, tabua means increase or means gain, income, revenue, like profit. So it says you will not have that. Well, did the Shemitah affect earnings? In well, look at image 41. Earnings. This is what the Shemitah, the pink, did to earnings. Image 42, U.S. corporate profit. That's what the Shemitah did to U.S. corporate profit. The Shemitah of 2015, get this, was the worst year for money investment of any kind in not seven years, not 14 years, in 78 years, which takes you back to the Great Depression. It takes you back to 1937, the last part of the Great Depression, which was a year of the Shemitah. And so here, it, I mean, it's a mind-boggling things. Now, what about, what about it, day crashes? Now, you didn't have to have dramatic day crashes. A lot of people are focused on that. But did the Shemitah of 2015 produce any of the great world day crashes of the stock market? The answer is, of all the greatest crashes in world history, listen, 20% of them were produced by the Shemitah of 2015. Image 44, 20% of them, one out of every five, was in this year. And not only that, the, the peak year of the Shemitah, or the peak time of the Shemitah, as you know, is Elul, the month of Elul going into Tishri. That's the month of nullification. That's, that this year was in the summer, going into the beginning of September, but basically mostly the summer. Well, the, the greatest crashes, those 20%, were not only produced by the Shemitah, but all in the month appointed by God as the month of nullification. All of that. Remember, if you remember what happened when, actually, when the summer came, everything started going crazy across the world. And I want to show you right now, the pink now is not going to represent the Shemitah, but just one month Elul in the Shemitah, if you put up image 47. That's the month of Elul within the Shemitah, the Dow Jones Industrial. This is what, now, what happened as well, if you put up image 50, you had some of the greatest crashes in history all during Elul of the Shemitah. Image, image 51, image, image 52. Hundreds of billions of dollars were wiped out in that one month appointed by God. It also produced the greatest intraday stock market crash in the history of the world or, stock, or Wall Street. Now, I want to show you one more thing before we move to something else, but just to give you a little taste of this. I'm going to show you a little chart that's going to show you the top 10 crashes, day crashes in world history. Image 53. Now, you don't have to look at, you don't have to see all of what's in there, but those are the top 10. Now, statistically, did, would any of them have taken place in the year of the Shemitah? Well, Shemitah is one out of seven years, so if nothing's happening, if it's just a normal thing, it should be one out of seven, so maybe one of them would be in the year of the Shemitah. And we will show that in a moment by putting yellow if any of them happened during the year of the Shemitah. That's it. That's how many took place in the year of the Shemitah. 70% of them, which goes against all odds. 
In a moment, I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to show you where those seven greatest cra or seven of the ten greatest crashes took place. If you look there, that's like the last 20 years. That's where all those crashes, or the 70, 70, seven out of ten of them, took place in world history. In one moment, don't do it yet for those who do that, but in one moment, we're going to put something in. We're going to put lines we're El representing the day that God appointed Elul 29 as the actual day and see if it hits anywhere near these things. Go ahead, put it up. That 70% of the greatest crashes took place, look how close to Elul 29. And the, and the rate goes between 99 to 100% proximity. So regardless, and the fact is, it is continuing to affect the world, trade and all these things. We are vulnerable. The world economy is, is vulnerable right now to any event, left it so, regardless of what happens. You know, the, the World Monetary Fund says that the Shemitah of 2008, well, they didn't say Shemitah, but 2008, the crash, has still has affected, has, has really shattered the world economy. We have never gotten back to growth, real growth, since that time. And now it's, it's in danger as well. Regardless of what happens or what doesn't happen, one thing is clear. In the year 2015, the ancient dynamic and mystery of the Shemitah has again powerfully manifested. One thing is clear, God is on the throne. God is in charge, not Wall Street. God is in charge of everything. Our blessings come from God, not from Wall Street. What about nations? One of the chapters in the book, in the mystery of the Shemitah, is the rise and fall of nations. That at times, you have these great cataclysmic changes or, or changes of world power happen in the year of the Shemitah. Well, it can mean the shifting of power. The American age began in 1871 when we supplanted the British Empire, became the most strong economy on earth. And you may have missed it, but one of the most important stories of 2015 was that the Shemitah of 2015 ended the American age. As it opened, as it opened, America's crown was removed and was replaced. It was put on the nation of China. The end, what began in 1871 came to an end in this time. Now this leads us into the realm of the harbingers and where we, and judgment. For those who don't know, the harbinger is this. In the last days of ancient Israel, before its judgment, and destruction, God sent warning, and warnings in the form of harbingers, prophetic warnings, nine harbingers of judgment, and those same nine harbingers that appeared in Israel in its last days are now, have now appeared in America. Some in New York City, around where we are, some in Washington, D.C., some involving American leaders, some involving the president, and have done so with eerie precision, warning of a nation in danger of judgment that once knew God, but now is in defiance of God. Well, that progression has not stopped. The template of the harbinger and of judgment has not stopped. What is that template? Here's a nation that once knew God, once was blessed by God, turned away from God, was warned by God, and then comes a shaking to shake it up. But instead of turning back to God, it responds with defiance of God. Specifically, in Israel's case, with a vow, Isaiah 9:10, the bricks have fallen in this, in this shaking, but we will rebuild with greater things, greater stones. The sycamores have, fall, have been cut down, but we'll plant cedars, stronger trees. We're coming back stronger, bigger, greater than before and without God. We're going to continue in our rebellion against God, and we're going to get stronger in it. Well, that is what happened also to the nation of America. As it was with Israel, so it is now with America. America has not only not returned to God, it has departed drastically from God. Since 9-11, we have not grown closer and more godly. We have grown farther and more ungodly. The pattern of the harbinger is that. But it not only comes from the destruction of the northern kingdom in 722 BC of Israel by Assyria, but also from the southern kingdom of Judah by the armies of Babylon in 586 BC. That's the mystery ground, comes from that judgment. So we go now to the judgment of the southern kingdom. Israel, around Jerusalem are the walls of defense protecting the nation from judgment. 
But the first sign of assurance that the judgment was coming is that those walls of defense are breached by the soldiers, the armies of Babylon. And once the hedge was removed, the judgment would come. It took place on the ninth day of Tammuz. That day became a day of national mourning for the Jewish people, so much so that two and a half thousand years later, it's still on the Hebrew calendar as the day of mourning, the day that the hedge of protection from judgment or attack and destruction is removed. The word Shemitah in Hebrew can also mean the fall. When did the ninth of Tammuz, the day of a nation's hedge being removed, fall in the year of the Shemitah? It fell one year ago this weekend. It fell on June 26, 2015. It was the ninth of Thomas, the day of removing the hedge of judgment. This was the day that the Supreme Court struck down the hedge of marriage. On that day, the day of removing the hedge, and the year here it is in the year called also the fall. And in the judgment of the southern kingdom, before it happened, a prophet was taken in a vision to see the temple of Jerusalem. And God said to that prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, what do you see? He said, Look, son of man, there are the elders of Israel, and they are worshiping idols in my house. And therefore, judgment will come. And so the principle that we must know, the principle is that before judgment comes an act of desecration. In the time of Daniel, the prophet, in Babylon, the king of Babylon says, take the vessels of the temple of, Babylon, of, of Jerusalem, the God of Jerusalem, take those vessels and use them, fill them with wine, and let's drink to the gods of Babylon. Act of desecration, taking what's holy and using them against their purpose, against God, and as they do it, a hand appears, a handwriting on the wall that tells them, this night, judgment. Desecration precedes judgment. Well, just as holy as the vessels of the temple of Jerusalem is the vessel that God created of marriage. And so on that day, a year ago, this weekend, we performed an act of desecration. A holy vessel of God. And what happened when that happened? All across America, it was celebrated by the lifting up of the colors of the rainbow. And I say, because it's not said, is the rainbow doesn't belong to man or a movement. The rainbow belongs to the living God. It is a sign of God. It's holy. It's sacred that he created. So they use the sign of, a, of God, of one desecration, to celebrate the other desecration. And then... The final one, the president gives the order to light up the White House in the colors of the rainbow. You can put it up. Making, here it is, the, the White House is the highest house in the land. It's like the palace of the king of Babylon. And now the handwriting's on the wall in the colors of the rainbow. The White House becomes a vessel of desecration. And I ask, how much more can we do in the face of God to provoke him? God is merciful. God's heart is salvation, but he is not mocked forever. So here we are at the anniversary, and what has happened? Interesting. As we approach that same period, a shaking comes on the world. England, Britain, leaving the European Union. We know the Bible speaks in the last days of a revived Roman Empire. Some say England was not part of the Roman Empire, but it was, much of it was, but it was always on the edge, just as it's been on the edge of the European Union. It threatens the breakdown of the global order. Now, whether it leads to that breakdown or whether stability is restored, what happened on Friday caused the greatest global stock market crash in world history. Global, greatest. In one day, two trillion dollars were wiped out. Trillion. For those who know the mystery of the Shemitah, the climactic month of the Shemitah is Elul. And the last, in the last Shemitah, 2008, well, actually, in the last Shemitah of 2015, three of the greatest world crashes happened in that month of Elul. 
But in 2008, it wasn't just the year of Elul, the, year, the month of Elul, it was Elul 29, the day that God appointed for the wiping out came the greatest Wall Street crash in history. It's still the greatest. What about globally? What did that crash do? Glo well, globally, it was the greatest collapse in the, of the global financial system up until now. Up until then. So this one just now became the greatest. The last greatest one was Elul 29 of the Shemitah. Now, when it, when it crashed, the Shemitah, on that day that crowns the seventh year, the number seven kept coming up. How much was wiped out of Wall Street on the day of the Shemitah, 2008, Elul 29? 7% was wiped out. How many points were wiped out? Seven, seven, seven. Point pretty much seven. You got almost four there. When the closing bell rang at that moment, at the moment of the Shemitah, seven, 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 God's fingerprints were all over. And the interesting thing is when you take that moment, 777, Wall Street, Shemitah, Elul 29, and go back 777 in time, interesting thing because could it actually give, a, give the timing of God? You go back, seven, go back seven biblical years, it takes you to September 17th, the closing bell of the other greatest crash in history on the same day, Elul 29, seven years before of the Shemitah, that alone. But then if you go back, you got seven years, go back seven days. So the seventh day takes you to a day that's very significant, which is it takes you to September 11, 2001. It takes you to 4 p.m. If you go back seven hours, it takes you to 9 p.m., the 9 a.m., the time of the attack. If you, go, if you go further, go back seven and seven minutes, it takes you to the exact minute of the attack. But what happens if you do the opposite and go forward from that moment of 777 and go forward 7777. What happens? If we take that closing bell, the mystery of sevens forward in time, 7777, from that crash, if you go seven years, seven months, seven weeks, seven days, it takes you to last Friday, the day of the greatest crash. The day the global order was shattered. That exact day. Both ways. The greatest crash the other way, greatest crash this way. This is, by the way, it's the first time I've ever shared that. In the last days of ancient Israel, there were three abominations that led to its destruction through which judgment comes. One was the offering up of their children as sacrifices to the gods of Baal and Molech. They offered up thousands of their children. And people say, you can't compare it to America. You're right, because America has offered up millions. And it began in 1973, 1973, just happened to be the year of the Shemitah, the fall. And this, in the summer of this Shemitah, when everything was happening, it was exposed that people were actually trafficking and getting money and profiting from baby parts. Did that stop our funding of it? Not at all. In fact, the people who exposed it, they were the ones judged by the state. The next abomination that brought judgment was that of sexual immorality, perversity, we've already seen that. But then there was a third, which in Hebrew is called shikuts. Shikuts literally means abomination, the abomination, but it also means the idol. That's why when the Bible speaks about the abomination, desolation, in Hebrew that's saying idol at the same time. In the last days of Israel, one of the signs preceding judgment was that of idols appearing throughout the land, false gods, the images of across the land. In the same summer that America struck down the order of God, something appeared in New York City on the Empire State Building. It was an image. You can put it up. What is that? That is an abomination. That's an image. What you're seeing is an image of a false god, undoubtedly the largest image of the false god in, a, in the history of planet Earth. It was the foreign god Kali formed by projectors projecting light onto the Empire State Building. Interesting because they're projecting light to create the image of Kali, who's the god of darkness. Woe to those who put light for darkness, says the Bible. A civilization that calls evil good and good evil. Kali is also the god of death and destruction now over New York City. If a civilization turns away from God, it turns to gods of death. Undoubtedly, that's how the worship of Baal came to Israel. First, there's obviously the voice of tolerance. Be open. 
just add Baal to your worship of God. And that's exactly how it happened because they were actually combining it. But as the worship of Baal gained strength, when it reached critical mass, everything changed. It was no longer a call for tolerance. Now the initial tolerance was just to get Baal in. But once Baal was in, now it changed to a war on God and to stamp out every vestige of resistance. No longer was it tolerance. It was now about wiping away anyone and anybody who held true for God. It was there in Isaiah when he said, they woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Because when you call, when a nation calls what is evil good, it will call what is good evil. In other words, if you sanctify the profane, you will profane the sacred. Every step taken to champion sin is matched by another step to delegitimize God and you, his people, to marginalize you, to mock you, vilify you, persecute you, prosecute you, ban you. So every step taken by American culture to glorify what is immoral is matched by another to denigrate the people of God. Has America grown more tolerant towards such innocent things as nativity scenes? No. No. Sees them as dangerous. They have to be wiped out of public places. How about something as dangerous as the Ten Commandments? Has to be taken down. It's dangerous. Wiped out. Believers are seen as dangerous. See, tolerance for immorality always ends up being becoming intolerance for morality. It's never anything goes. It's only Baal goes. It's one or the other. So Elijah says, choose this day whom you will serve. If Baal is Lord, serve him. But if God, then serve him. You can't have both. It's no accident that at the same time when there's a voice saying you cannot speak, you cannot say this is wrong, at the same time on television, God is openly mocked now. Messiah is openly blasphemed on television. What has happened since this ruling one year ago? The ruling forced government workers to sanction what the Bible says is a grievous sin. A woman government worker said, I can't put my name on that. I won't. So she refused. What happened to her? She was thrown in jail. The question may be asked, where were all the other Christian government workers who did put their name on it? What happened? Thrown in jail for not going along with that which was just before not legal. Some say, well, she's breaking the law. Well, so are the apostles. When the Sanhedrin said, you be quiet. And they said, well, if we're going to serve you or God, you, may, you, you decide which should we go by. So were the first believers when they were told, worship Caesar or go into the lions. They said, we'll go with the lions. Between man's law and God's. So the believers in the Third Reich, when they hid Jews, those against the law, they chose God laws. God. Interesting, though, if you remember in California when same-sex marriage was not legal, and a number of government officials broke the law and issued licenses. Strangely, none of them were put in jail. No one ever called for them to be put in jail. But when a Christian woman says, I can't go along with it, they put her in jail, and the White House says it was right for her to be thrown in jail. So it was in the last days of Israel. When, when the judgment came in the jail, were, in jails were righteous people, and the jail was Jeremiah. It's already happening. Christian business owners have been driven out of business, lawsuits, fines. The government is increasingly disassociating itself from Christians, which means the government will become increasingly anti-Christian. It was said early on, the religious rights, the rights of religious freedom is not going to be affected by this. The fact is, as soon as this was passed, it became obvious that it would. When the lawyer for the White House argued the case for changing marriage, the Supreme Court justice asked him, but... If this happens, will it not lead to the state punishing religious schools or schools that believe in marriage? And he would think he would have said, he had to be prepared for it. He would have said, well, we can't talk. We don't know. But he didn't say that. He said, yes, it will become an issue. Meaning any religious school that doesn't go along with it against God's word will be stripped of its tax exemption, driving many of them out of business. So if a Christian school follows God, the state will seek to destroy them and will only sanction those that break God's word. Kind of like a communist country. Remember the progression. 
Recently, the president ordered, and by the way, this is not politically correct. We're not here to be politically correct here. If you are, you're in the wrong place. We're here to be correct, eternally correct. We're not here for political correctness. Because if we can't speak the truth now, when are we ever going to do that? The president orders every school in America to transgenderize their bathrooms and apparently their shower rooms. If a man feels he's a woman, goes into the woman's, the woman's shower. He said, this is, this is anti-discrimination. No, this is lunacy. And several states that have said no, the federal government launched lawsuits against them. Now children as young as five in kindergarten are being indoctrinated against God and toward the direction is that they may be gay. Five-year-olds. In the 1960s, when prayer was removed from the schools, President Kennedy got on the air to assure America it wasn't the end of the world because people thought it might be. Many in America thought not having prayer in school would be a major thing, how far we've come. Well, when you take God out, it never stays that way. You never take God out and it stays neutral. Take God out, other gods come in. Take the light out, darkness comes in. Can you ever imagine this? Well, that was the conclusion of it. Remember when Sunday was the wonderful world of Disney? On television, family entertainment, children's entertainment. Sunday was the day families would come home from church. Disney represented family-friendly entertainment, often based on children's stories, classic fairy tales. Remember something called the family hour? Big issue in the past that 8 to 9 p.m. has to be safe for children and families. Recently on Sunday night, on ABC, which is now owned by Disney, during the family hour, 8 to 9 p.m., there was an episode of a program called Once Upon a Time, based on classic fairy tale children's characters. Little Red Riding Hood, Snow White, Dorothy, Wizard of Oz. One Sunday, recent Sunday night, the program ends with the scene in which Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz is lying asleep under a spell from which she cannot be awoken except by true love's kiss. The scenario is taken from Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, where the princess is awakened by the prince's kiss. Only now there's no prince. Now a woman approaches Dorothy. And the woman is Little Red Riding Hood. And the woman bends over her instead of a man to kiss the woman. And this is broadcast all over. It was foreshadowed in a recent Disney movie called Maleficent, where instead of a prince, it's a woman and kissing the Sleeping Beauty and saying the subtext is you don't need men. Men are disposable. You could have a woman instead. And so interesting because Maleficent means evil and she's shown as good. So now Little Red Riding Hood is kisses Dorothy and she wakes up. But she doesn't just kiss her, she makes out with her. They are presented now, Little Red Riding Hood, and did you ever imagine you'd ever see Little Red Riding Hood and Dorothy depicted as lesbians making out with each other on television? What part of hell came up with that? Could you ever have imagined that? And that's just the beginning. And then this Friday, as we approach the anniversary of this date, President Obama announced the first national monument to homosexuality. He's making the Stonewall in a national monument. He directed the National Park Services to search out for hundreds of sites celebrating the movement to promote homosexuality for consideration as national sites. So we are witnessing here monuments of America. Interesting, because monuments, you have monuments to America's foundation all over that were marked by the Bible or by the cross or by the faith in God and they are being removed. And what's coming in its place? This. Monuments to the Ten Commandments struck down. Monuments to sin raised up. Crosses taken down, celebration of sin raised up. When Jeroboam led Israel away from God, he said to them, he made two golden calves and said, these are your gods, Israel, who took you out of Egypt. What was he doing? He was rewriting history. Why? Because you want to rewrite the future, rewrite the past. That's exactly what's happening. So he became the first president to enlist the nation in that cause. So we are to celebrate Stonewall. What exactly is Stonewall? It was the place in which the modern agenda of homosexuality that is now threatening the gospel itself was begun. What was Stonewall that we are to celebrate? It was a bar owned, a gay bar owned by the mafia. 
a bar for drag queens, transvestites, and male prostitutes. We are to celebrate it. America's new glory, monuments. The mafia apparently would blackmail people who went to that bar for more money. The police apparently were being paid off by the mafia, but apparently weren't getting the extortion money. So it seems it wasn't even about the other thing, about vice. It was about they, they started, they came down on the bar, they raided the bar on June 28th, which is around now. That's why all over the world there are gay prides, pr prides, <laughs> pride parades about this. Now all over America to celebrate, the police begin ar arresting the mafia, staff, customers, but then the patrons gather around the police and violence breaks out. The police are inside the bar. The crowd begins throwing garbage through the windows lit up on fire. The police reach for hoses to put out the fire, but there's no water. And someone begins pouring lighter fluid into the, into the bar that the police presumably would be burned alive. That is what we are celebrating. That is what the president says we are celebrating. While the government punishes Christians for observing God's commands. Woe to those. As we approach this year anniversary, what has happened in California right next door? California is generally a sign of what's coming. The California state government has passed a law that saying that school, the school system, including private schools, colleges, has to go along with the promotion of homosexuality. Originally they said, but religious schools are exempt. That's how you get in. But now they are, the bill has just passed by the California Senate stripping the exemption saying Christian schools have to go along now. And if you don't go along with it, you will be stripped of any funding credits or anything. Further, it opens the door that anybody comes there, if they want to sue the school, the school will lose and will be driven out of business. Effectively threatening to wipe out every Christian school in California. This is where this is heading. And now we come to a presidential election. We have a choice that involves risk in any, every direction. It seems that America has already rejected those who held clear biblical stands, and even Christians did. I wonder if that's judgment. And on one hand, you have, there's one who says he will make America great, okay, but without a return to God, you cannot be great without returning to the God that made America great. These laws, if you say we will be great, Without that, and we'll continue on our road, you're, what are you saying? You're saying Isaiah 9, 10, we will rebuild and become stronger than before. We don't come back. There's not salvation in pride, but in repentance and humility. People don't realize something. When I wrote The Harbinger several years before, one of the people in its pages is there. I won't tell you where. Donald Trump is in The Harbinger. You can find it. He's there. I won't say where. We must pray that he will come to a real spirit of repentance in God. And there are hints, we hope. On the other hand, the alternative represents a party and a spirit which at its last convention, presidential convention, actually booed God. If that one gets in, she'll undoubtedly appoint a Supreme Court justice that will mean that every case concerning God, his ways, and you as people will be ruled against you. And at that point, we don't need now another activist president for things to fall. The ball's already rolling down the hill. All it takes is a president who won't stop, the, stop it, and it's going to go faster. If I asked you which person made this statement, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Chairman Mao, Fidel Castro, it's this. Deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed. The answer is Hillary Clinton. Deep-seated religious beliefs must be... How do you say that unless you're God? How do you overrule God like that? Why? She said, so abortion can expand. The days ahead are going to be interesting, people of God. As we come to the close of the Obama years, someone who was also in the Harbinger, on one of the anniversaries of 9-11, he read from a psalm they, in his speech there on 9-11, but that particular psalm was very interesting because it speaks about the person who's speaking it. The president spoke it, and it speaks about the one speaking it, and the words it says is, I am a mofet. What is that? Mofet, the one who speaks it, I am a mofet. It's translated differently in different translations, but the word means a sign. I am a sign.
president speaking. I am a sign. But Mofet means a prophetic sign. In fact, it means a portent sign. It actually means a sign of judgment, so it can be said, I am a sign of judgment. And the word also means harbinger. As if Obama was saying, I am a harbinger. Now before we bring this home, something to share as, as of God's sovereignty. Because with all this, God's purposes still move forward. There was a man, an African minister, named Robert Moweri. He would be used to affect the history of Israel and the world. And I'm going to share that in a moment. I heard about him. I mentioned him at certain points where I was speaking. I had no idea, but at the time I mentioned him, he had a dream. In the dream, God was having him take a test, but he didn't know the answers of the test. He failed. Then in the dream, God showed him a book, and he was told in the dream, you failed the test because you didn't read that book. He had to read it to pass the test. It was a real book. He never read it. He didn't know what it was about. The book he saw in the dream was the mystery of the Shemitah. So he was then trying to reach me, and I'm speaking about him. And then suddenly the Lord put us together. We met across the, across the country as I was speaking somewhere. And what I'm going to tell you is confirmed by eyewitnesses, several. It's absolute fact. Robert Moreri said the Lord told him, you must speak to Benjamin Netanyahu. He thought, how can I, an African minister, talk to, have an audience with the Prime Minister of Israel? Well, then he's at a gathering. A man puts his hand on his shoulder, and he begins his sharing. He just shared, and the man says, I know Benjamin Netanyahu. And actually, I can arrange it. He actually arranges it. They fly him to Israel. Now, this is the late 1990s, this 1990s when Benjamin Netanyahu was prime minister of Israel, first time. He gets an audience with Benjamin Netanyahu and his cabinet. And he says this. You know, Benjamin Netanyahu says, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want to tell me? He says, I have placed you in power. Do not give up my land. If you do, I will remove you from power. And Benjamin Netanyahu laughs. One of those present who heard it was Ariel Sharon. A while later, Netanyahu was pressured by the Clinton administration to give up land. He does. And after that, his government collapsed and he throw, he's thrown out of office. Removed from power. Ariel Sharon would later become president and do the same thing. A few years later, the man, the, the, the African minister, Rob Maria, gets another word. He, he says, you must speak to Netanyahu one more time. So Netanyahu comes to Florida. And he tells Robert Murari, he tells his friend, I, I will speak. I have to speak to him. And the friend is saying, oh no, please, not again. You know. And, and Netanyahu's at a Christian church that supports Israel. It's a gathering for Israel. Netanyahu's about to speak, but he's backstage in the green room. Moeri, Robert Murray goes up to him, goes to the green room, and he sees Netanyahu. Netanyahu sees him, recognizes him, and this time Netanyahu's not laughing. And Robert Moreri says this to him in front of others. You will once again become prime minister of Israel. If you honor his covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob regarding Israel, he will honor you and exalt you. But if you disregard his covenant and give away his land, he will dishonor you. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people you will divide an inheritance of the land, which I swore to their fathers. He added, do not ever negotiate the land, to give away the land for peace. He said, God is not done with you. Years later, Obama comes to power. Soon after that, Netanyahu comes to power. God puts him back in power, according to the prophecy. And if you notice, this time he's been strong. And the President Administration of America has been pressuring him. They don't, see, they don't have the best relationship. Hoping in every way he's going to be removed from power. And it looked like he was going to be, if you remember. CNN was saying he's, he's gone. And, you know, they're all, all the liberal media saying he's gone. And then all of a sudden they went, they blacked out. They became silent. In the middle of the election, they stopped saying anything. Because all of a sudden, miraculously, Netanyahu was winning. And so finally Netanyahu got out and said, well, nobody's going to say it. I'm going to say it. I've just won the election. So he was put back in power. Now he's in line to become the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel. But the story, you won't hear it behind the, the news, is the prophecy. Netanyahu knows it. But there was something else said to him in that prophecy that came true. The prophecy came true and something else was said. 
said, you will be prime minister again at a critical time in history. And this, listen, it was said, you will be the prime minister of Israel for the restoration of the tabernacle of David. What is that? The tabernacle of David signifies the kingdom of Israel, the throne of David. Uh, Acts 15, it even speaks about the church, and it can mean the temple of Jerusalem. And listen to this. A while later, Moeri sees Netanyahu again. He's called to his office, and I spoke to an eyewitness who was there, and Netanyahu takes out a picture, holds it up to him, to them, and says, this is what it's all about. What was the picture? It, Netanyahu was holding a picture of the temple of Jerusalem. A prophecy about restoration. Anything that leads to that is certainly going to be a jubilee of restoration. And you see, no matter what happens in the world, it doesn't stop the purposes of God. In the early 1960s, America started removing prayer and the Bible from public life dramatically. But it's led to where we are now, but after, after, it was after that that came 1967 where God fulfilled his ancient prophecies and restored Jerusalem. After that came the, revi the modern revival of Jewish people coming to Messiah. The Jesus movement came after that. God is never finished. And in this current prophetic jubilee, nothing has to happen. And there are interests, instances when events take place on a Western calendar which would be 2017, but regardless whether something does or not, regardless of what happens concerning this great falling away, you are of God. You're not of the world. So there's no reason that the year of Jubilee shouldn't be a year of restoration for you Amen. if you take it. See, Jubilee can only happen when something happened. It can only happen on Yom Kippur when the atonement was lifted up. Then you have Jubilee. Well, the atonement causes jubilee. Well, Messiah is the atonement. He's our Yom Kippur. Therefore, he's got to be our jubilee. God's power, the power of Messiah is jubilee. God's will for you is restoration, is reconciliation. God's will is that you be restored, you regain, you come into the inheritance that God appointed for your life. Sometimes, as with the children of Israel, you got the inheritance there, but you got to fight for it. Sometimes you got a war for it, but it's a good fight. Fight the good fight of faith until you take possession of your inheritance in God. There is no reason you should not be victorious at every moment. Because in Messiah, you've got the power of freedom, reconciliation, taking, receiving what God gave you, being set free. Believe that power. And you will. It'll be a jubilee. A last thing before I bring this home. I came to the Lord, and I'm the least likely person to come to the Lord. I really was. I was an atheist, a Jewish atheist in high school. I won't go through the whole story, but I was the lead of the rock band. I was the least likely person. And I only came to the Lord, I'm just going to skip the deals, but I only came to the Lord because I was literally hit by a locomotive train. And I won't go into that now, but that might explain some things. It says Jews need signs. Some Jews need locomotive trains. So I knew then, this is, very, this is how smart, I knew then it was a good, wise thing to give my life to the Lord. Because I didn't know how long I had. I didn't know how to do it. Nobody was leading me. But I remember from Hebrew school, God met Moses on the mountain. Elijah on the mountain. So I found a mountain. At night I ascended that mountain to the mountaintop. There I found a flat rock, I kneeled down on the rock, and there I gave my life to the Lord on that rock. Years later, I returned to that mountain. On the anniversary of me coming to the Lord, which is also my birthday, won't go into that, it was night, I went up with a flashlight, a Bible, and a shofar, and a talit, Hebrew prayer shawl, and I, I had a great time with the Lord. The next day, I go to the congregation, and the last person online comes as a present for me. It's a framed gift. They bought a framed drawing in a store and they showed it to me. It's a drawing of a man on a mountaintop with a shawl blowing a shofar. I said, that's weird. That was me last night. 
I said, really? I said, yeah, I went to the mountain. I found the mountain where I came to the Lord. I said, really? She says, tell me where it is. I said, oh, tell me what mountain. I said, I don't know what mountain. I just, I just know it's the place where I came to the Lord. I don't know the name of it. She says, describe it. I describe it. I tell her the, where I could, what I could. She says, I know that mountain. I said, really? She said, I live at the bottom of the mountain. I said, really? She says, do you know what that mountain is? I said, no. She said, that mountain is dedicated to Satan. I said, really? Well, I got saved on the top of it. She said, on the top of it, that's where they were, that's where they worship. I said, really? I said, well, I came to the Lord on the top. I, I knelt down on this flat stone. She said, that's the altar. I said, wow. I remember on that mountaintop seeing graffiti words in the rock, and the words always puzzled me. It said this. It said, no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. And when I first saw it, I said, who would write such a thing? Nazis? I mean, who would write that? Satan worshipers. More than that, not Satan would write that. See, for 2,000 years, he'd been trying to keep the Jewish people from coming to their Messiah. And he's done everything he could to stop them from doing so. No Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. I said, too late, Satan. I'm in. I got in. This Jew came back to the sacred ground of his Messiah. And that kind of explains my walk. My walk in the Lord has never been dull. I wanted to be, but I mean, most believers get saved in nice carpeted church sanctuaries. I get saved on a satanic mountaintop. They get, they get handed pamphlets that say, God has a, a wonderful call for your life. I get no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. But that's the point. And God's put me in places I never would have met. God's, that's the point. You see, when you look at what's happening in the world in the last days... You can be tempted to say, I wish I didn't have to deal with all this. Or listen, you know, listen, you know, I don't have any, I mean, we're, it seems like we're on the losing side. Listen, God didn't have to put you in the last days. He could have put you in the Middle Ages, but he chose to put you in the last days because you were called for the last days. If you weren't called for these days, you would have been in the Middle Ages. You would have been a squire or a cobbler, but God put you in the last days because you're called for the last days. Your calling is for now. And you can only fulfill it now. So you're never to fear what's going on in the world. Because if God called you to be here, then God anointed you to be here. And if it's dark and darker, so what? Does a candle complain that it's dark out? No, it's too busy shining. If it wasn't dark, the candle would be out of a job. That's why we're the light of the world. If it's not dark, we're out of a job. We're in a fight. It's okay. When God, God has called us to be victorious and more than conquerors, why are we fearing the fight or saying that, or embrace the fight because that's what will manifest who you are. The fight is the very thing that manifests that you are victorious. There's going to be a fight anyway. You might as well get into it. You might as well embrace it. You might as well go for it. You might as well enjoy it because these are dramatic times. Good. God's here. You've got the power to fight and triumph. The enemy did everything he could, in my case, to stop me from coming to salvation. He's done everything to stop the Jewish people from existing and coming to Messiah. Why? Because he knows when they do, he's finished. It's over. He's defeated. And so with you. The enemy tries to hinder you, intimidate you, scare you, discourage you, trap you, snare you, depress you, make you panic, make you believe you're going to lose. Why? Because you're going to win. Think about it. If you were, think about it. If you weren't going to win, why would he bother attacking you? Because he knows what it means. Because when you fight, you're going to win. And when you win, he loses. When you win, then you're going to walk into everything God called for you, which is so great, it drives the enemy crazy. It's not a bad sign. It's a good sign. No matter what happens in the world, God is never finished. And God is never on the losing side. Neither are you. And the fact that you get to stand with God when it look when it's not popular, that's glory. It's, you know, you stand with God when it's okay, when it's respectable. Who cares? When you stand with God when it's not, that's when he says, well done. Well done. My spirit's with you. My glory's upon you. That's an honor. The fact that you get to stand with a king when he's not yet reigning on the world, that's a privilege. When in an anti-Christian age, what a high honor. 
It's the Bible. You want, you know, some of you have been praying for a long time. Oh, Lord, I wish I could live in Bible times. I wish I could live in Bible times. Well, good news. Your prayers have been answered. <laughs> Congratulations. Because you want biblical times, you got them. Start acting biblical. You want the days of Elijah, you got them. And you got Jezebel, well, I'm not being political, but you got... <laughs> Instead of fearing the days of Elijah, try, to, try a new thing in the days of Elijah, start becoming the Elijah of the day. These are days that produce the greatest believers. See, the enemy tried everything to wipe away Israel. And after all that, after everything he tried, if there's even one Jewish people left standing in the world, he's defeated. And that's a sign to you that your God is real. Tonight, the fact that I'm standing is a sign that God is real. That any Jew, it's God is real. Your God is faithful. Your God is true. And when God gives his word, he's going to fulfill that word. When he gives a promise, he's going to fulfill that promise no matter what it takes. The love of God, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God are stronger than this world. They are stronger that there's an Israel. It's stronger than all hell. So it doesn't matter what's against you. Not your problems, not your adversaries, not your weakness, not your circumstances, not the world, not the flesh, not the devil, not even your own sins. It doesn't matter. Nothing will overcome the one who is in God and who walks in God. If after all that there are, is a Jew in the world, it's a sign you're on the winning side. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, don't waste your life fearing or living a half-life. Be bold, be strong, go for it, be great. Go all out for him. Go all out like David, like Paul, like Elijah. Go all out on fire for the Lord. God is the God. Our God is the God of the Red Sea. He's the God of the resurrection. And nothing will conquer you. Nothing will hinder you. Nothing will stop you if you go out with God. And he will anoint you and he will be with you to do it. For greater is he who is in the you who is, and he who is in the world. Greater is he who is the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Lion of Judah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the hope of your life, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We praise you, Father. We bless you tonight. We thank you that you are real here, Lord. And I ask your spirit be on every one of your people right now. Every one of your children. The spirit of glory. The spirit of victory. To replace any other spirit. You have called us to overcome. You have called us for victory. And we praise you and thank you, Father. We thank you for all you have done. We thank you that your name is El Shaddai, the majestic, the powerful, the all-providing one. Lord, I ask for anyone who's here tonight who doesn't know you, they would come to know you. They would come to be born again, your child. No matter who they are, no matter what the sin, we're all in the same boat. But Lord, I ask that you touch your children. Father, we... This day we make a commitment that whatever, anything that's in our life that shouldn't be, we rule it out and we will take a step even tonight. Before we go to bed, a step saying no more. And Lord, whatever is not in our life that you've called for our life, something new to become that man, that woman of prayer, of victory, of breakthrough, of love, that we will take a step even tonight to say yes and rule it in before we go to bed. Have your way, Lord. And we ask, Lord, have your way in the days to come. We don't fear it, Lord. We just, we embrace the fact that we can stand strong for you. And we embrace the fact that a light that shines in the dark is so much more powerful.